season two, episode 18 starts right now. We have a big old show today. We have a special guest. I'm your host, Brandon Davis, joined today by Aaron Perrine. What's going on, everybody? Moon night. Moon night, baby. <laughs> uh, Jetta Anderson is here. Hey, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Uh, we're happy to have you, Jenna, and uh, thank you to everybody who has been subscribing to the YouTube channel. Yes, we are live on YouTube today. Thank you for joining the Twitter community. Uh, a lot of you guys have been connecting with each other and talking about Doctor Strange and Moon Knight there, and that's been awesome to see. Um, and we're going to be talking spoilers for Moon Knight and Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness today. So there's a heads up for you. If you have not seen them, that is what's coming today uh, because the first half of the show specifically, is all about Moon Knight. All right, we have a special guest, someone who put his first Marvelous stamp in film uh, two decades ago in the Spider-Man trilogy, and now came back to Marvel to be the executive producer of Moon Knight. Joining us live on Phase Zero, Mr. Grant Curtis Grant. Thank you for joining us on Phase Zero. Thanks for having me. Are you kidding? This is awesome. It is our pleasure, our privilege to have you. We are super excited to talk to you. Uh, the way we're going to do this is we're just going to kind of go character by character and then hit you with some general kind of Marvel Comics MCU stuff, if that works for you. Bring it on. I'm here. And in the comment section, if you guys have any questions, I encourage you to drop them in there. If you can get a word in over Jim Viscardi, good luck. We'll try our best <laughs> to get to you. Uh, I'm going to kick us off. Uh, first of all, the first character I want to start with is Mark Spector. Uh, Mark is the character who we see trauma through through the lens of Mark Spector. Um, and I thought that was really, really powerful. And that, that episode where we see that he created the alternate personality was really incredible. Um, I would love to hear about the discussions around, uh, you know, showing, making sure the emotional payoff is there, like developing kind of like how you handle like a mental health issue. Obviously, it's fictional. But I'd love to hear about just what went into that. I mean, first off, hats off to Jeremy Slater, our, our head writer. Uh, and then obviously, clearly hats off to uh, Oscar, who did an amazing performance. Without Oscar, uh, we're not talking Mark Spector and we're not talking Stephen Grant. Uh, and then clearly our directors, Muhammad Diab and Benson and Moorhead. But really, um, you know, when I started that, that sentence off, it was hats off to Jeremy Slater because Jeremy and our incredible room of writers, it was really through Jeremy who said, I want to introduce the audience through the lens and through the eyes of Stephen Grant because Stephen Grant is learning all this real time as the audience is. So if I can put the audience in the same shoes as Stephen, we're cooking with gas. And that was Jeremy. Uh, and, you know, I'll be honest, it was something I didn't know uh, if it was correct. I'm a little old school. I like my moon night starting with Mark Spector. Uh, and so uh, it was a little bit different for me going through the lens initially of Stephen Grant, but man, was that a smart narrative choice on his end. And then Oscar ate, Oscar ate it up. I mean, Oscar loved playing Stephen Grant. Now, you know, you've, you've heard him in interviews. I mean, he loved Mark Spector too, and obviously Jake Lackley, uh, but Stephen Grant's who he fell in love with first and it shows on screen. And that was that was really what, what lit that fuse. And then we brought, you know, in, on the mental health side, you know, we brought in an incredible consultant, Dr. Paul Puri, uh, and he really helped us. He read the scripts. He watched the edits. He, he was with us from day one to the final day. We had an amazing group of consultants that guided us, um, but it was really through Oscar's amazing performance that you fall in love with these guys who are struggling with mental health, struggling with their past, present, and future, and coming to terms with that. And um, we got six episodes out there that people like, so uh, we're happy. I'm happy. Yeah. Uh, it was great, man. And Mark, obviously, as you mentioned, Mark is the character from comics that it kind of is the first one to come to mind. And we do touch on quite, like the, the this these first six episodes of, of Moon Knight. Hopefully they're the first six and not the only six. Uh, but they Let's get Kevin on the phone. Get Kevin on the phone. <laughs> hey, if you want Let's to call him, I think. Uh, uh, but it, it was really interesting to see that you guys really uh, – you named Bushman. You talked about that history with the archaeologist and how he was left for dead and all those things uh, that happened to him. How much, uh, like, did you consider showing Bushman? Did you consider diving more into comics? Because I know that's kind of stuff that you eat up. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we talked Bushman. We talked everybody. You know, what what we did do, one of the initial tasks was to go in through and read every comic uh, that he ever appeared in. So, you know, we were reading West Coast Avengers. We were reading all the different Moon Knights and trying to see, you know, is there an issue that we want to absolutely do as our series? And what we found out is that there wasn't a particular issue or a particular run 
it was really those tones and themes that have been written so amazingly over the decades that we wanted to spot that we wanted to shine a spotlight on. Um, and you guys know those tones and themes because I know you like the, the comic, but it's it is that globe trotting action adventure, uh, very Indiana Jones esque. Uh, it is the Egyptology inherent in Mark Spector and, and Conchu's origin story. It's the spooky grittiness that makes Mark Spector and Moon Knight and Stephen Grant and Jake Lockley, bless you, sing uh, and so cool. Um, and it's also the comedy that's in the series. But one thing I love more than anything is the writers uh, of the Moon Knight series since 1975, since since Werewolf by Night, kept the audience guessing. Um, and, you know, we've talked about this. It wasn't a gimmick, you know, because gimmicks gimmicks become a crush that, that the audience throws away right away on the page. Um, but what they were is story points that, that always kept you guessing. And I think that's why people, if you love the Moon Knight comic book, you're all in and you love it. And for all the right reasons, it's because it's written so well. Uh, and so that's, that's really what we grabbed onto. Uh, and I, I think, I think we, I think we did a good job. And when I say we, I, I do mean Jeremy, all the great writers, Kevin, Kevin Lou, Victoria, Brad, uh, it takes an army and it shows. Uh, and that's yeah. what, that's what, that's what's exciting more than anything with the six episodes in our rear view mirror. Um, man, it's a, it's a cast of hundreds. It's a crew of hundreds and, uh, it takes a lot. And, um, we put our stamp on the Moon Knight universe uh, in the MCU and, uh, we'll see where he lands next. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you said landing. Um, and I, I think I have a, a question here from one Jim Viscardi. Uh, can you settle for us once and for all what exactly Moon Knight's powers are? Cause he's got a lot of stuff going on in this series, you know? He's got it going on in this series. Uh, you know, he, hey, he's got a healing factor. You know, he, he bounces back when he, gets, when he gets shot or stabbed. He heals. He doesn't heal right away. And he's, he's not immortal. Um, you know, if you, if you get him the right way, he's going to go down for good. But uh, thankfully in our show, he got back up. He can glide. He's stronger than most people. He's faster. So it's a little bit like um, a super soldier, like, like my pal, the Green Goblin from uh, Spidey One. Not not quite the same thing, but uh, th that a uh, little stronger, a little faster, heals, glides, kicks ass, uh, takes names, the, the, the usual. I'm going to go ahead and update the wiki right now. Nice. <laughs> Chilling, <laughs> kicking ass, taking names. All these are his superpowers <laughs> right along, all the other stuff. You mentioned the Green Goblin, though, and in the comics, Moon Knight has a bunch of other toys, like a bunch of other stuff. I know a bunch of us geeked out when he when Mr. Knight finally had those the uh, screaming sticks at the end. We're like, yes, he's got all the stuff. He's got all the gear. Uh, is there any you think that in the MCU he'll evolve to have more, his more modern looks or any of these other gadgets like a glider for himself, perhaps? Hey, I hope so. I mean, there's so much there's so much groovy stuff out there. We just scratched the surface with the crescent darts and the truncheons and, and all that, um, you know. Uh, he's got a whole bag of tricks that we didn't even get into. So uh, yeah, I'd say I'd say when and if and where this character lands, uh, he'll have a new tool chest. Okay. Speaking of landing, I'm gonna pin this one on Jim Viscardi too. <laughs> these are these are Jim Viscardi questions. These are just like, Jim Viscardi questions. Yeah. I'm just can't, like he's got me. He's got a trap door under me right now on this comfort couch <laughs> that he will send me down if I don't ask this. So can he actually? Can Moon Knight fly? And did the full moon have anything to do with that? Because there was an awesome sound effect when he took off to go handle Harrow at the end, like middle of uh, episode six. Rockin' sound effect when he takes off. He can he can glide. He can glide, and that okay. was he was it was it was glide assisted by Conchu, uh, you know, the god of the night sky and a little wind generated there. So he was he was going uh, a, a you know Mach three or something. I don't know my mocks. I should, <laughs> but uh, he was Tom he was Cruise definitely hauling. Here. Yes, yes. He was hauling. Yeah. I love it. Um, and then going back to Stephen Grant, he obviously has the biggest changes from how he is portrayed in the comics. He works at a gift shop instead of being a wealthy businessman. How did you all land on the Stephen that we ended up meeting in the show? You know, again, it was, uh, I can sing the praises of Jeremy Slater all day long. It was just really looking at what made the best um, character arc and kind of put Stephen Grant in an unfamiliar spot. You know, you always think, oh, Stephen Grant's the the sexy millionaire about town. And well, that's cool. Don't get me wrong. That's, that's cool. We all want to be the sexy millionaire about town, but you know, what if he, what if he was 
um, kind of the guy who is at the gift shop, who doesn't have it all together, who's a little bit awkward, not terribly confident. And that just became a character that we wanted to see more on screen. And it was a character that evolved in the writer's room. It was so cool. We were in the writer's room about halfway through and we took a little poll, you know, um, who was team Steven and who was team Mark. And 50% of the people raised their hand for Mark and 50% raised their hand for Steven. And that's when I knew we really had something because that type of um, percentage is what uh, really spurns that, uh, you know, that water coffee, that water cooler talk on Monday morning. Well, I guess in our instance, what is it, Wednesday morning or Thursday morning? <laughs> uh, so if, you know, if half the people like one guy and half the people like the other, uh, we've got something special. And then in the hands of Oscar, no brainer. I love that. And then you touched on Steven's confidence. He gains quite a bit of confidence over the course of the season. What do you, would you say is the biggest difference in the character from when we at the start of the show to when we meet him at the end of the um, and sorry, you, you cut out my earpiece for just a second. Just the, the oh. biggest difference between um, what, how we meet him in the beginning and how we meet him at the end? Yes. That damn suit. He's got that sweet <laughs> suit. That's got to be the biggest difference. Uh, no, I, it's, you know, it's, it's the confidence level. You know, when he's sitting there um, right before that incredible, incredible fight sequence with the truncheons, when he does show Layla, the amazing Scarlet Scarab, uh, kind of their new power set. And now that they've merged and now that they're clicking on all gears, uh, you know, wants to show him what, what, what he can do now. I think that confidence really, you know, when you, when you look at the Steven that is in the, um, when he's getting fired in episode two and he has to take off his uh, name tag, that means the world to him and place it on that table, which is just ripping your heart out. Cause you realize what that really means. His life was wrapped up in that museum and now it's gone and the blink of an eye, it's gone. And then you look at the guy who is just mowing down the bad guys with the truncheons and that great uh, Declan inspired suit. Uh, I, I think that's the biggest change. And I, I think that's what I think that's the ride that we go on um, from episode one through six, you know, from frame one. Uh, I think the audience is invested in to the final frame as well. And uh, it's, it's Stephen and Grant. It's, St it's Stephen and, and um, Mark Spector and Jake Lockley that uh, make that ride so amazing. Um, to like ask a question about Mr. Knight and the suit, uh, a, a, a fun part of these Marvel things now is seeing when people deploy a, a superhero landing. Um, <laughs> yep. he, uh, didn't, he didn't stick the landing. He did, he not, did not stick the landing. Stick the landing. Nope. But it was a, a fun bit. A little bit. You know, he's got time to work on it, right? He's got yes. plenty of time to work on that, that finish the finish it out. Um, was it did it was it like a Deadpool reference, or did you guys just want to have fun with the idea because it's such a popular thing to happen in the MCU? We've had four superhero landings in these Disney Plus shows oh, by my yeah. count. <laughs> you know, that, that landing was really Oscar and, and that was that was all him and that, that little comedy beat when he doesn't stick the landing and it's a little bit off balance. And, you know, that's what's so refreshing about working with actors like Oscar and Ethan and May when they're working at the top of their game, uh, especially through a character narrative um, standpoint they can riff on stuff like that and it just seamlessly moves into and becomes part of the character. So uh, again, uh, that's, that's all Oscar um, Jake at the end. Uh, that's all Oscar. And you're in the hands of someone who's always coming from it from character, character, character first. And uh, you know, you're, you're better for it. Did Oscar keep anything? Did he take, did he steal any suits or props? Oh, I'm sure he's got a chest full of cool stuff. Uh, that I cannot <laughs> confirm. No, hey, um, you know, in my for me, Oscar can have whatever he wants because you know he he was he was leading that charge in in many ways, especially with the Moon Knight suit. We had a really cool Moon Knight suit, uh, and then Oscar came aboard, and you start asking questions. He wasn't picking stuff apart; he was just asking questions from the the lens of Mark Spector, but also from the lens of being a fan, from doing his own research and looking at the at the costume through the ages and saying. What if we dialed this aspect in? What if we dialed that aspect back? What if we really embraced the mummy wrappings? Uh, so uh, yeah, Oscar Oscar deserves a Oscar deserved to walk away with a few things. So he I, hope, I hope I hope he did. I, it was episode five that was the episode that I like was just so blown away by his performance and the crew on this production's performance because that was just him twice, you know, in every scene. And it was so oh. immersive and so well done that I never even, I watched that whole episode. And I remember at the end of episode four, I sat there and I was like, how'd they do this? 
you know, this is cool. I'm, I want to figure it out. But then episode five, I never even tried to figure it out because it was so immersive. It was so well done. Oh. Yeah. It, it's bonkers. I'll, I'll tell you two things. It was funny. After episode one or two, I can't remember, my mom texted me just emotionally devastated from the journey that, uh, you know, Oscar was taking her on. I'm sitting there going, oh, my gosh, what, what's she going to do when episode five rolls around? Because if you get if you're emotionally <laughs> exposed after episode one and two, uh, yeah. do, do I do I give my mom a spoiler and say, don't watch five? Uh, I didn't because uh, um, we don't do that at Marvel, as you can imagine, even for moms. But uh, she watched five and six and loved the whole series. Um, but the other thing, you know, what 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 you're touching on is not only is Oscar's artistic performance seamless, but his technical performance is seamless because what people don't realize when he's walking down the hall and there's two of him, he has done that one pass. And, you know, as you can imagine, it's more than one pass as Mark Spector. And then he does it another pass as Stephen Grant. But when he does that pass as Mark Spector, he's remembering where he's looking and what Steven's eye line is and, you know, wh where he has to hit his marks at it every time he walks down the hall uh, and his body shape and his body position. And then he's got to remember that and then do that again as Steven and line up those eye lines. It's just a funky math problem. It it's crazy because you guys know I worked with Sam Raimi for, for years and he would throw me in front of the camera. I couldn't even hit one mark. I, I would get so <laughs> nervous. I had no clue where I was. I couldn't even hit one X on the ground, let alone about five X's down a hallway where I have to remember where I am at all points so I can repeat it as a different character on the other side of the hallway. It was incredible. Uh, but that's Oscar for you. He's amazing. Wow. I know. Oh, so kind of going, you mentioned Layla earlier um, when we were talking about the show. Layla in the finale drops in as an Egyptian superhero. It is such an awesome debut. That's honestly one of my favorite parts of the entire series. Um, can you talk about taking Scarlet Scarab and turning this villain in the comics into this awesome new, more heroic character? Yeah, well, you know, when we were in the in the writers' room, originally Layla did not become the Scarlet Scarab. Uh, but you know, the more we really embraced uh, the Egyptology of this ride that Muhammad Diab was leading the charge on, and the more May came aboard, and the more we got into these marathon um, riding sessions in Budapest, we would we would go to the um, local Four Seasons, and obviously because of COVID, uh, you know, we were in a big room, and there was just about eight of us. We just kept on breaking down episode after episode after episode and character, character, character. And once we really started to get in there and wrestle around with Layla, um, with with May and that character and realize, you know, unbeknownst to all of us uh, in the writer's room with Jeremy and team, we really created a superhero with Layla from the very beginning. Because obviously her at Mogart's, she knows she knows her way around. She can take care of herself. It's like, man. We have this incredible superhero already. Let's go all in. Let's let's um, you know merge that with the Scarlet Scarab storyline. Let's launch Egypt's first uh, superhero. And May was amazing. And that was man when you, when you're talking about this stuff that you just cannot talk about when you start these interviews before the show airs. The the one that I was always just biting my lips like can't talk about the Scarlet Scarab. Can't talk about the Scarlet Scarab. But I knew that was coming, and it's so cool. When, when that stone slab falls down and the dust settles and Scarlet Scarab steps out and she's got that little grin on her face and then those wings come out, it's like, all right, game on, here we go. Uh, and that, that was the genesis of it. Uh, it, was really, it was really May being May, May being such a great actress. And we realized um, with her, we had, we had a superhero in the making. So, uh, you know, obviously Kevin, Kevin gave the thumbs up. Kevin was all in. And um, now there's another really cool superhero in the MCU. Along with, I know you guys were talking uh, when you did your episode six wrap up of Tau Edit. So uh, there's there's another one. Let's let's see where those two go. I want to know where Moon Knight goes. But where where does where does Scarlet Scarab and where does Tau Edit go? Let's uh, let's let's see what that oh. let's see what happens with those. Oh. Who knows? <laughs> oh, okay. I I also it, it was. I'll, I'll tell you a little. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a little Tau Edit story. We were early on in the writer's room and, you know, we, we start throwing up all sorts of art on the boards just as inspiration um, through the through the decades. Anything goes. You know, we had we had all those different looks of, of Moon Knight up there. We had pictures of Egypt, pictures of the pyramids, awesome, awesome renderings of Kanchu. And we had uh, this poster that showed all the different Egyptian gods. And if you look closely in episode one when um, Stephen Grant is talking to Donna in the storage room, in the background, 
um, there's a re there's a recreation of what we had in the writer's room. And we also blew up the the Tau edit, uh, the lovely uh, hippo, uh, and put her up on the wall. And Kevin came in one of the first times when we were just starting to crack the story and looking around and seeing, you know, what this world could be and, you know, not knowing what everything is exactly, but looked over, saw, saw the Tau edit pictures like, okay, I don't know if this stuff is in the show. That hippo, she's in the show. And uh, she never, of all the things that changed, of all the characters that came in and out, the hippo never left. And uh, awesome character uh, performed by Antonia. Uh, really cool. Sorry, we, a little tangent. Little no, tangent. I love that. We, we, have, we have a question kind of about this that, that we have coming up. But all I'm going to say right now is that if, if Gore the God Butcher comes anywhere near my hippo, it's our hippo. Uh, uh, there's gonna be there's gonna be hell to pay, but we'll get we'll touch yeah. on that in a bit. Uh, a couple last things here as we get to the end of this interview. Thank you so much for giving us so much time. Uh, we got to talk about Jake Lockley. Uh, that was such an exciting reveal. There were the teases throughout. Um, you guys introduced him in the post credit scene officially. There were theories yeah. online like, oh, was this Jake in this scene? Was this Jake there? Did we see him or did he ever kind of pop up and emerge for a moment or was it the blackout moments were the only moments that Jake was present through those first six? Well, I don't want to alter anyone's experience. There was the one scene I, that went viral. I, Cause I, I do know there's a lot of theories out there, but I will, I will say this. You, you guys are smart. We have the best fans in the world. Uh, you know, Jake appearing in episode six at the very end was not the first time Jake appeared in our narrative. And uh, I'll let people take that uh, take that for for what it, whatever it means. But uh, that was that was not his introduction. He was in the show uh, from episode one. Well, now now I have to go watch the show for the fifth time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but did did you what was the discussions like to to figure out like how Mark and Stephen don't really know about Jake, but there is this other presence that's kind of doing the work that needs to get done in order to survive, even if it's a little too ruthless for the two, even even Mark. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. It's one of those things where when we laid out the show as we originally thought it would, it was, as we originally thought it was going to be, it was more of a three-hander. It was Mark, it was Steven, it was Jake. Uh, but then when we threw everyone else in the mix and you have the incredible Ethan Hawke playing Arthur Harrow and you have F. Murray Abraham as Conchu and you've got obviously May as Layla and then the Scarlet Scarab, it got really busy and really crowded. Uh, and even though six hours, six episodes is an amazing canvas on Disney+, Plus. There was just too much, and we mm -hmm. realized if we pulled if we pulled back on Jake and really made it that two hander between Mark and Stephen, we had a rich, rich character study that was going to interest uh, an Oscar Isaac, uh, and so that's really how it happened. And then that amazing tag, uh, I don't know if you can get a tag better than that. I mean, there's I'm not saying we have the best tag in the MCU by any means, but that's a cool one. Uh, and it that's really that's that's how it evolved. It, it it was just an embarrassment of riches and. We had to pluck one of those riches uh, named Jake Lockley and put him as the tag. And I think it worked out perfectly. Yeah, it's a great tag. The, the car, that's a that wasn't a cheap car. That's not, he, that's not just a cab driver anymore. Uh, oh, that's, anything you can give that's us. That's a Rolls, on, baby. It's a Rolls. I'm yeah, that's worth more than my life. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I have to ask, any insights you can provide on how the heck Jake Lockley can afford a Rolls Royce with a license plate that says Spectre? It's a, it's a great question. It's a great question for the future for the future of the MCU. Uh, and uh, hey, I want to be a fly on the wall of that rolls as it rolls away wherever they go. I'm in. Uh, got my money. So kind of I don't know if I'm to... getting in that car because I saw, <laughs> yeah, I saw, I saw, I saw Arthur Harrow is Arthur is dead dead. They ain't coming yeah. back. <laughs> thousand percent so kind of speaking to the larger mcu how much access to the stories of other projects do you have while you're working on a series like this so you can try to connect them if you want and also try not to interfere with whatever they might be doing oh we interact with my colleagues all the time on the other shows and riff and talk and you know it's how it's how things get done at marvel uh it's not the only way they get done but it is the connectivity uh the camaraderie the sharing of storylines, uh, it's pretty seamless. And, uh, you know, I think all of our shows are better, uh, but it's, you know, that's what the water cooler's for. You know, that the same the same water cooler conversation about, you know, Team Mark or Team Steven happens on all sorts of topics at Marvel. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there's just a lot, lot of really groovy, geeky storytellers uh, trying to tell the best stories uh, Marvel possible. 
speaking of this sort of interplay between all of you on the different projects, you guys did manage to slip in like a Rama Tut reference in their design with that kid's jacket while Marcus tried not to like hurt him. And then he, of course, <laughs> does the job for him. Uh, is King of the Conqueror one of those ever present characters behind the scenes? Like, I know you guys must have had conversations about him with all him being in Egypt and stuff. You know my answer to that. Kevin Feige <laughs> is the ultimate puppy puppet master. Uh, and uh, we will see We will see um, how, how Kevin uh, works with the whole MCU. But uh, I'm excited to find out the answer to that, just like you are. We we did see we did see Conchu survive that Godzilla vs Kong style blowout uh, at the at the end there. But uh, Gore the God Butcher is on the way to the MCU. I've seen some interviews where you guys have said uh, you considered discussing Gore, and I mean for Gore to earn that God Butcher reputation, some gods are going to have to fall, I imagine. So should be should we be worried about Conchu or anybody? Oh, I can't. Here? I can't be throwing spoilers for. There. All the, I'll get killed at the water cooler. It's for you. <laughs> okay. We don't want it. We, you don't, we keep, want you back here. Yeah, yeah you got to keep me on the good side of the water cooler, not the. Right. Not, I don't fair. want daggers being stared at me <laughs> or thrown these, these at me. Are, that's why we save these kind of general general MCU. Like, how did this almost happen? Is this going to happen? That's why we save them for the end because we can fly through them. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So kind of going off of that, um, there were interviews saying that there was consideration of the Eternals making cameos. How close did that come to actually happening? You know, I, early days, I mean, you, it is. It's such, a, it's such an incredible universe that Kevin, Lou, Victoria have, have created over the years with obviously a lot of other incredible producers uh, at Marvel. And, you know, the knee-jerk reaction is to try to ask if you can play with all the toys. Um, you know, whoever that might be, who, who could, who, who has traveled in and out of the Moon Knight universe uh, on the comic book pages. But what we did realize early on is those connections just did not jive with the story we were telling, because you guys know this. Um, at Marvel, it's character, character, character first, and all of all of the shows at Marvel are truly intense character studies. And once we really started to wrestle with the character study that is Mark Spector, that is Stephen Grant, that is Jake Lockley, and this crazy Egyptian god that's um, manipulating them, Kanchu. The more those connectivity points just faded away, and the more we have what you guys saw on screen. Uh, and I think we've got a better show for it. Not not a better show. That's not the right terms. It's just I I really like the fact that my mom, of all people, can jump into the MCU and enjoy Moon Knight as much as the guy or gal who's seen every MCU offering you can ever imagine. She loved the show. My dad loved the show. They see a lot of Marvel stuff. They don't see it all. And they did not need to know all of the backstory of, of what had happened before. Uh, and so, hey, at some point, there's a lot of names that you guys know that have floated in and out of uh, a possibility to be in this series. But the reality is um, we needed Mark. We needed Steven. We needed Jake. Um, Scarlet Scarab and Conchu and Arthur Harrow and a few others, um, Tau Edit. Uh, but uh, we, we think our show is, is pretty complete uh, with what we have. Um, are there any Easter eggs that the fans have not spotted yet that you're surprised that the people haven't found yet? Um, <sighs> I don't think so. You know, they found the QR codes. I, I, hey, I'm a I'm a I'm a geeky goofball. Uh, so I, I I like the fact that you know the the poster from the writers' room is in episode one. Stuff like that people wouldn't know. So it's kind of like whatever your definition of an Easter egg is. Uh, but there there's stuff like that um, littered throughout. Uh, you know, there's some really groovy, cool um, tips of the hat uh, in Mark Spector's childhood bedroom to what that looked like on the page. You know, if you kind of AB it side by side, there's some cool stuff like that. I haven't, I haven't seen that thread uh, on the internet and not that that's going to change anybody's life, but it really goes back to how cool it was drawn on the page originally and how amazing uh, our production designer, Stefania Sella and her team, an amazing, amazing set decorator, uh, Veronique. And um, you know, you just like everybody riffs off of each other because you know, you don't have a, you don't have a comic book and a character that's been around since 1975 unless you're unless it's cool in some way, both the narrative and on the and how it's drawn. And we we always tip our head tip our hat where we can. And there's there's some other stuff out there, but do do look at Mark Spector's childhood bedroom on the page and kind of go back and forth. And there's some cool there's some cool um, similarities. 
All right. So these are these are my last two questions for you, and then we'll let you go. Uh, first of all, I know you're a fan of the comics, like like the rest of us. If you were in control of uh, Moon Knight's fate, are you sending him on a path to West Coast Avengers or Midnight Suns? Which one do you think is more fun? Oh man, you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, which, oh man, it, it's it's tough because mm-hmm. um, Midnight Suns, you get the supernatural things go bump in the night. You you know me, um, drag me to hell. Uh, I'm all in on that stuff. That's how that's who I cut my teeth with. One of the masters of of that tone. But then you got West Coast Avengers, and he famously ripped up his card. Who does that? So I, I don't know, man. Um, man, that's. Uh, uh, I'll take either one. I don't mean to be wishy washy. There's oh, I, the, 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 you. You pick the two best ones, and uh, they're they're awesome. I'll, I'll go on that ride either way. Either way. Well, we're still at day one. And who knows what the future holds? And the last thing I got I got to ask. Can not you go that asking? How how are things looking for a season two? Any any anything you could share? I hate to be a broken record. That is another Kevin question. Uh, and I know you have his talk- number. Call him. <laughs> I do. I have his number. I have his I'm number. just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm, obviously, I'm just kidding. I'm obviously not at uh, Marvel right now. I will be later. I'll pop my head in. I'll try to get the scoop for you. Uh, hey, cool. Let us know. Uh, hey, yeah. hey. I, w- I want to see wherever that character lands. It's an amazing character, yeah. um, written and drawn so well over the years, embodied by Oscar on screen. Uh, like I said, I pushed. I'll push all my chips in on that. I'll go there. Hey, uh, you got most in demand premiere of 2022. That's. That's pretty incredible, and it's it's Moon Knight's just getting started. So we're 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 really proud of you guys. We're really grateful for you guys. This was a this was a great show, and uh, you did great work on it. So so pat yourself on the back over there at Marvel, and thank you so much for joining us, Grant. This has been a pleasure to speak with you and hear this kind of stuff from you. It's an honor. I love what you guys do. The support's amazing. Um, thank you, thank you, and thanks for having me. This is this is cool. This is my and this is my last interview. I think this wraps up my uh, my press. So uh, went hey, out with nice. a bang and. With wow. the best group possible. Well, Thank if you ever want to come back and just chop it up about projects you're not even working on, you're welcome to join us. Uh, but we'll I'm let in. you get back to some free time, take a little vacation. You've earned it. Thank you so much for, for joining us. And everybody, we'll be back in just a minute. We're going to talk about some Doctor Strange theories, Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind down at Epcot, and uh, some more Guardians updates, actually. So we'll see you all in a minute. Thank you so much, Grant. We'll, we'll see you soon. Have a great day. Welcome back to phase zero. Uh, if you're watching live, you got to hear me gulping on my water during that break there. It was crispy. Um, thank you so much to Grant Curtis for joining us. Thank you to Disney for setting that up. Uh, it's just an absolute pleasure to get to um, to chop these things up with the people who make them, especially when they're as enthusiastic and charismatic as Grant is. And I hope uh, everybody listened and had a good time with that. Aaron, Jenny, you guys just crushed that. So thank you for that. That was so much fun. When he mentioned like last episode, us talking about episodes, right. six, I was like, oh my God. It's like, it still is surreal having anyone who's tied to this, like be aware of our show, much less like stuff from. So it was just so much fun. That was so, great. That was when he said that, I was like, wait a second. You, you yeah. listen. You, yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, yeah, that was cool. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah. Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. You guys, we have a bonus episode about it. 
full reactions, full reviews. It is available now. But there is one theory. This is actually going to be a video on the Phase Zero YouTube channel that will be super fleshed out there as well. But I'm going to flesh it out here. Uh, I haven't really seen people talking about this. And it, I think that Avengers vs. X-Men, the spoilers <laughs> for Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness follow. <laughs> I think that Doc Strange and the Multiverse of Madness may have set up Avengers vs. X-Men and Secret Wars in ways that we didn't even realize uh, immediately because Wanda went in there and she killed the leaders of every major group from the 858 universe. She killed Charles Xavier, the leader of the X-Men. She bl blew off Black Bolt's head. Well, actually, she made Black Bolt blow off his own head. That was so deeply unsettling to me. Um <laughs> And that is the leader of the Inhumans. Captain Carter, maybe that's the leader of the Avengers in that universe. Uh, Captain Marvel, maybe that's the leader of the Ultimates. Uh, who else did she kill? Everybody found Mr. Fantastic, who is the leader of the Fantastic Four. And his kids are in that universe. So if you've read Secret Wars, you know that Valeria and Franklin Richards play a big part in the Secret Wars comic. Everybody's just like, ah, it's a different universe whatever, whatever it's, you know, who cares that they they care. The people from that <laughs> universe care, right? So you would think maybe Valeria and Franklin are going to want to find a way to get revenge for their father. Maybe all of the X-Men are going to want to get revenge for Charles Xavier. Maybe all the Inhumans are going to want to get revenge for Black Bolt. And they're going to imagine if somebody showed up in the 616 universe, killed Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, Black Widow, Hawkeye, and Hulk in 2013. Well, I guess there was really nobody else at that point. But in 2017, you'd have Spider-Man, you'd have Captain Marvel, you'd have all these other heroes trying to figure out how to get to that universe to get their revenge. When Thanos wiped out half the universe, they went up there to kill him. They didn't go up there to try to... Uh, well, I guess... The, I don't really remember. It's been... I'm, it's all cloudy. <laughs> but I do think this sets up a possible Avengers versus X-Men, right? Because a multiversal Avengers versus X-Men, and then that can lead to actual secret wars. But I think that this story being set up as Avengers vs. X-Men sets it up better than the comics ever did. The comics had such a hasty, bad, unfounded footing to start that war that I was always kind of like, man, I don't know. I see the comment section is saying Damon Streams had this idea. Shout out to Damon Streams uh, for having such a wonderful idea of big brains. Uh, but yeah, what do you guys think of this? Um, I, I, I felt the same way because, I mean, like I was like, me and Jenna the, on the spoiler podcast joked around. Freaking mortal still in that ditch, <coughs> and he's a witness. And you can't leave <laughs> witnesses just hanging around after everything that's happened. The yeah. kids are gonna be mad, all those other heroes are gonna be mad. Heck, the people of that earth are like, Man, the thing that was protecting us from everything else is now gone. The buffer zone is completely eradicated, or at least the highest levels of it are completely eradicated. So I like I like where your head's at. Uh, you know. Eggers directing a version of the Northman with Franklin Richards sounds very <laughs> funny to me. It sounds amazing. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, I agree. I feel there's definitely validity to it. My only worry would be like I still want X Men and FF movies set in the six one six universe. I don't want it to be a thing where in order to build to Avengers versus X Men, we now have to follow the versions of them from eight three eight, and we don't get that in six one six. But like, I definitely agree to the point of like Franklin Richards is going to he's he's going to get his revenge in one way or another and that would be such an interesting way to like start that ball rolling to get to Secret Wars. Could you imagine well, them like opening it with like the Tom Cruise version of Iron Man doing an <laughs> inverted version of Downey's speech from the end of Avengers 1 about how we come <laughs> and we're going to avenge it and then they go and try to hit the it would be nuts. It would be crazy. Yeah. So oh, I'm all wild. about that. I, I, I'm very, this is like, this is my favorite theory I've ever had. I hope that it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that, it, I hope that the 858 universe ends up, was it 858 or 838? 838. 838. Okay. So the 838, shoot, I think I did the whole video. <laughs> That's being edited Just right now. Just go dub it, it in. <laughs> oh no. Uh, but yeah, no, I think that whole 838 universe could end up, really coming for the 616 because and there's also two sides to that too because you have mordo who's going to be rallying people to go get revenge and you have christine over there who will be like well you know maybe we can draw lines here and maybe it's even a divided group of people from the 838 universe 
who go after them. So yeah, Franklin, Franklin's gonna be pissed. <laughs> He raises his son to be vengeful, like TJ and them are saying in the comments. Yeah. His great grandson. He's like, We've always had a beef with this universe. You'll be the one to go take my revenge, kid. And then it's just freaking Jonathan Majors walks out like, You killed my the grand my great great grandfather. Prepare to die. Uh, Morbi- Morbius would have ended Wanda. <laughs> Morbius, I, Morbius should have ended me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, I do. But anyway, I, I, I find this theory to be interesting. Whether or not that that universe is going to come back into play. Like, imagine Cyclops here in the news that somebody from another universe killed Charles. Imagine Jean Grey, Logan. You know. Imagine Medusa and all the Inhumans. Imagine you know everybody else. As is Steve Rogers, little skinny Steve. Hearing Peg- he's going to be like, oh, there's two Peggy's now, kind of. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, that was brutal. That sequence was insane. I, I was shocked that was in a Marvel movie. Uh, it was some of the most creative brutality I've ever seen from from these types of films. But yeah, anyway, uh, if you guys want to talk more about that theory, you can drop some comments. I also want to talk about. Uh, uh guardians of the galaxy cosmic rewind uh, i got to go down to epcot i got to experience the new guardians of the galaxy ride and it is incredible uh the whole pavilion is awesome it's loaded with Novacore stuff it's loaded with super dope merch lots of groot lots of uh rocket raccoon and all kinds of guardians merch in a gift shop called the wonders of xandar it's really cool because you walk in uh to the queue line and it's like this big it's they call it the galaxarium and it's like a planetarium and um it's got a big screen on the top and it talks to you and it plays music and it sets the ambience and it, uh, the ambiance uh <laughs> and it does all this stuff to kind of keep you entertained while you're in the queue line and one of the things it does is introduce itself as the zandarian world mind which i found really interesting because the world mind obviously is a big part of nova the last century on Nova. So we haven't heard the word world mind in anything in the MCU. And obviously this is not really the MCU because they also make a bit about Groot died saving Xandar, but grew back to his fully formed self so that you could have the regular Groot. Um, but the ride, you see, there's lots of Easter eggs in there. There's stuff on the site you can find. Um, and then the ride itself is really cool because you sit down and it's like, 10 rows, I think. Yeah, 10 rows, two seats across. Each car seats two and two. And then you go out and, like, you're going, you're basically going to try to stop a celestial from um, sending the Earth back in time to an, a full reboot because he deems Earth a failed experiment. Uh, and it's, like, it's just really cool because you walk, you, you, you go through, and the, it's like a 360 degree screen, but the cars, that you're in move to continue keep you facing the screen. So you can be moving forward, you can move in sideways, you can move backwards diagonally. Uh, and then it gets to a point where you're parked facing the screen and the basically everything is completely turned around. So if you started in the last row, you are now in the first row, you're facing the other way. And then it launches you backwards and music starts playing and you go back and you go over a hill and it turns and does all this stuff. It, and it's like the guardians are talking to you the whole time. You do like a, you're going sideways through this helix, looking at the moon, looking at the earth. Uh, it's 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 a really fun roller coaster. It would be super fun with, even without the guardians of the galaxy imagery, but it does have all of that. So it it really is a it's it's super super fun. It's about two and a half minutes long. I filmed the whole thing, and that's how long it took to film it from start to finish, about two and a half minutes. Um, and it was it was really cool. I did it seven times wow. <laughs> on that first day. And it was funny because like I, they had they would assign you like a Disney rep who was with each person there to just kind of help you through the day for everything. Um, and he was just like, this is never going to happen again. This is amazing. We're just walking right up like for the rest of our lives. This will be like hours and hours of waiting. And I was like, yeah, man, uh, let's just keep riding it. Uh, so we did. <laughs> So we did. And he was a shout out to Michael, who was uh, really awesome. <laughs> and uh, that was fun. Uh, but yeah, so the Go- Cosmic Rewind was awesome. I don't know if you guys have any questions about it. I think I just over explained it. So <laughs> uh, I will say, like, I'm, I'm kind of picky about roller coasters. I don't like being like super lurched around or all of that. So like how intense is the actual coast part of it? Um, 
It's not, it's really not that bad. Uh, it's kind of like Space Mountain, but a okay. bit more amplified. Like it never hits like rock and roller coaster intensity. It never goes upside down. Uh, very interestingly, there was a Disney cast member named Candy who was friends with Michael, who was the guy who was working with me the whole time. And she was terrified. She would not go <laughs> on it. Um, and she was like, I don't want to do it. It's everybody's saying it's really fun. I don't want to do it. Shout out to Candy because she um, she came on the ride and she was very scared, very nervous. And she was like, where's come source? I'll just close my eyes and wait for it to be over. Um, and then she had a blast and she wanted to do it again immediately. So we went on one more time. So even somebody who was very afraid of uh, the roller coaster aspect of it had a blast. Um, it's super smooth. Like it's not jerking you around. It's not bumpy. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything. There, there's only a couple of moments of like that kind of come out of your seat airtime type stuff. And I love that stuff. But uh, <coughs> so it was, I approve. It, it gets my firm seal of approval. <laughs> Okay. You know, and ha however rare that is. <laughs> but, uh, last thing today, speaking of Guardians, uh, Volume 3 is wrapped. Everybody shared photos of them all hanging out after Guardians Volume 3 life. And the depressing thing here is that uh, Dave Batista posted the photo and said, uh, haven't found words yet. It ended so suddenly and I was on to my next film before I could process it all. End of a journey that changed my life. So um, Drax is dead. Yes. <laughs> there ain't no way Drax survives this movie, man. And that kills me, but I get it. I, I, I think he's going to be the one who sacrifices himself. And he's like, I could be with my wife, Yvette, my daughter, Gamaria. And that's it for Drax. I, that's, and that breaks my heart. I don't know if I'm ready. Between that and the possibility of Rocket, which I know we've spoken about at length on this show, like I, I am not ready for the emotional roller coaster of this movie. Not at all. I, I, I am slightly concerned that the tone coming out of filming this movie is more solemn than freaking Wakanda Forever. And that should alarm all of us. <laughs> Because someone actually isn't there. There's a reason to be that upset coming out of Black Panther 2. And it's every single one of these goodbye messages out of all the actors that are in Guardians sound like the most, most emotional thing. Every single one of them is the speech at the end of freaking Armageddon. Between <laughs> Willis. Like, and it's weird. I'm like, wow, it's really going to kick us in the teeth. Yep. None of us are ready. James oh, no. Gunn is... Uh... He, I mean, James Gunn made the, the neck beard joke in Peacemaker end up having an emotional payoff. Like, yeah. if this, it, he's gonna, he's gonna hurt us. He's gonna hurt us. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's just the way it is. Yeah, um, but yeah. Oh, also Jennifer Holland has been cast in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three. We don't know who she's playing, uh, but Jennifer Holland is an uh, an actor who was in Peacemaker, who will be in Black Adam. Uh, she's also, I uh, heard James are engaged or married. Yes, um, they're engaged. Yeah. yeah so it's, I, I love it. I respect the hell out of James Gunn, how he always takes care of his people, how he always like, he, like he may, I swear guardians volume two is a movie he made for Michael Brooker. Like mm -hmm. he, he brings people with him and he takes care of people. And I respect that. Wait, gun. Yeah, I, I, do think, I was about to say, I do think he debunked it. Because it was a thing where he had a photo of Jennifer and Zoe Saldana, and it was like the way that he worded the tweet made it sound like Jennifer an was an unannounced movie, cast he, member. Yeah, but he was like, "It's an uh, he, the only other photo he has of Zoe is with an unannounced cast member." And so, yeah, oh, the okay, movie. never mind. Strict yeah. all that from the record. Jennifer yeah. Holland is not in Guardians of the Galaxy. She was Volume in 3. one of the earlier films, so she ha she is already there. If people want to hunt for her, I think she's in the first one, if I remember correctly. So, but yeah. Oh, was she? Yeah, I'm pretty Hold sure. So. Jennifer Holland. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Guardians one. Scott Peter hacking into it I right don't know. now. Whatever. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, but all right. How much how much Nova I, stuff did you buy while you were yes. at Epcot? Brandon? That's an important question. Because I saw all that stuff and I'm like, Brandon, there's no way he didn't buy any of this stuff, man. So here's the thing. They wouldn't let us buy anything. Oh. oh. And nothing was on sale yet. So I had oh. to just look at it all. And I had to uh, head on home empty-handed. Well, they gave me a hat. I think uh, the hat's upstairs. They gave me a little hat, a little Cosmic Rewind hat, which is really cool. 
But uh, they just they just flaunted all that merchandise, and they were like, "Take pictures of it, help us sell it, but oh. you can't have it even if you give us money." Oh. So, but no, it was it was it was it was it was yeah. All right, y'all. Maybe we'll go back. Maybe I'll go back to Epcot at some point uh, and buy everything. Maybe I, I should just start saving my money. Uh, but all right, y'all. Well, this was a I, thank you so much to Grant Curtis for being on today's show. Uh, yeah. Thank you to Jenna and Aaron for being wonderful co-hosts on this show and, and uh, doing a great job with that interview. Couldn't do it without you. Uh, thank you to the comment section for dropping a few fun comments. Uh, Jenna, your, your your parting words for season two, episode 18? Uh, just follow me on social media at Hey, it's Jenna Lynn. Go read some comics. Go read George Perez comics. There's I, I've said this on the show before, but like there's so much that that man has done that is legendary and worth reading, especially after the events of the past week. So go read his comics and just go read comics in general. Aaron, you're up. Uh, at, at Summit Lake Hornet on Twitter. Um, I would like to say I'm going to be writing a thing about Neil Adams's contributions to Marvel later today that they uh, did. So he also passed recently and had a big effect on all the stuff we do. So go read both of those creators. They're worth your time. Uh, yes, I encourage that, and uh, that was a tough loss for the comics community. Um, I just want to thank you for, to the comment section. Thank you to everybody uh, for being awesome, and um, we'll be back next week. See you all soon. Thanks for a great episode.